No matter how spontaneous our dating profiles may claim we are, the reality is that humans, without a doubt, we're creatures of habit. We may think there's some sort of reverence that we give to the concept of rituals, associating the word with superstition, religion, or just magic. But our everyday rituals say a lot about us. Like, gee, humans are pretty impressionable. Why is that? Because a lot of the little daily routines many of us adhere to actually come from advertising. Welcome to Sponsored Thoughts. All right, let's kick things off with a ritual that kicked off many a day when you were a kid. Mom wakes you up, you grumble your way out of bed, wash your face, brush your teeth, and after an advisable post-toothpaste waiting period, you pour yourself a nice tall glass of liquid sunshine. Ah, orange juice. You may just be a glass of sugar, but you're a glass of sugar from a fruit, so part of a complete breakfast, as far as the food pyramid is concerned anyways. So how exactly did the pride of Florida end up being the default morning liquid for anyone under the age of coffee drinker? Well, considering nearly 80% of the world's oranges go towards making the beverage, you may be surprised to learn that until 1907, orange juice just didn't exist. And oranges? They had a bit of a supply and demand issue. In fact, they had abundant supply, but very little demand. To try and drum up that demand, the California Fruit Growers Exchange, sorry Florida, did what brands do when they're trying to find a new market. They hired an influencer, or at least the 1907 version of an influencer. An ad man by the name of Albert Lasker who would later go on to be known as the father of modern advertising. Since nothing rhymes with orange, Albert wasn't going to be able to rely on a catchy rhyming tagline to make people go bananas for oranges. Instead, he did a little math and realized that a single glass of orange juice took two to three oranges to make. Except, nobody had ever really heard of orange juice prior to that point. No problem, says Al. We'll just call the campaign Drink an Orange give ourselves a little sunny branding with the name Sunkist, sell a juicer with a bundle of oranges for 10 cents and tell people it aids digestion, prevents overeating, boom, you have yourself the first ever juice craze, folks. Today, the US consumption of orange juice every year is equal to an estimated 532,000 metric tons. Not too shabby for a marketing gimmick. While we're on the topic of breakfast time rituals, let's talk about bacon. While bacon and eggs may be the most iconic breakfast pairing in Western brunching, it wasn't always the intuitive duo we think of it as today. Especially the bacon part. In fact, until 1917, when Good Health magazine declared breakfast the most important meal of the day. The morning meal had traditionally been a lighter fare, or even a continuation of the fast from the night before. So when PR consultant Edward Bernays was hired in the 1920s by the Beech Nut Packing Company to help increase customer demand for the salty, sizzly strips, breakfast angle was a novel idea. Unlike our orange juice pal Al, father of modern advertising, Bernays, as the father of PR, preferred to bypass advertising and go for a more indirect route of changing public opinion. You see, Bernays wasn't just a PR expert, he was also the nephew of famed Austrian psychologist Sigmund Freud. And the family business impacted the way Bernays approached PR, who was a big fan of using psychology to persuade consumers. Bernays knew that people were more inclined to take advice if it came from experts that they trusted. In this case, physicians, rather than an ad. So we had a chat with the PR agency's internal doctor, which apparently was an actual role at PR agencies at the time, and asked for the good doc's take on if a heavier breakfast might actually be better for Americans. Doctor said, sure, more energy to start your day? Sounds legit. And then to make it even more legit, Bernays had the doctor write to 5,000 of his closest physician friends to get them to sign on with the claim as well. 4,500 wrote back in the affirmative. This study was picked up in newspapers and magazines with the attention of course being drawn to any physicians who called out bacon and eggs as the ideal way to achieve a hearty breakfast. Okay, okay, enough breakfast talk, let's talk about diamonds. You know, getting down on one knee and beseeching your beloved to plan a wedding with you may not be a daily ritual for most of us. I mean, if it is for you, dude, maybe take the hint. She's not that into you. But it's safe to say that statistically speaking, it is happening on the daily somewhere. And chances are, many of those proposals feature something sparkly. But diamonds weren't always the go-to for engagement rings. Diamond engagement rings kind of just became a thing. In 1938, diamond company De Beers hired ad agency N.W. Ayer to make diamonds happen. 
And Ayer pulled out all the stops, going beyond marketing the product and instead marketing an idea. That idea being that the measure of a man's love and professional success was directly related to the size of the diamond he proposed with. Well, over the next decade, the agency went hard on getting diamonds into the spotlight, lending diamond jewelry out to Hollywood starlets, getting magazines and newspapers to write stories and show images of celebs that reinforced the notion that diamonds equals romance. Their campaign strategy in 1947 even included arranging for lecturers to visit high schools across the country to deliver lectures on diamond engagement rings, mostly to set expectations in starry-eyed young women. which. Man, don't even get us started on how messed up that is by today's standards. Let's just let it, we'll just let it ride for now. And let's not forget the iconic tagline, diamonds are forever. Well, sure, De Beers, if you ignore the period of forever that existed before the 1940s. May not be how time works, but the campaign sure works. Remember in 2020 when we all decided that toilet paper was the thing we felt was so important that it was top priority for hoarding? I mean, personally, our household became a two-bidet home amidst that, and let me tell you, we're never going back. But TP is still the OG of butt tidying in the West, so let's take a look at where toilet tissue kicked off. The first toilet paper in roll format was introduced by Scott's brand in 1890, but and the brand wouldn't even really take credit for the idea until 1902 because, you know, who wants to be the brand to say, uh, you know, our whole thing is poop. The taboo was actually a hindrance to getting consumers to get on the TP train because people were too embarrassed to ask for it by name. One German brand even leaned hard on their branding to avoid the toilet taboo, boasting the tagline, ask for a roll of hackle and you won't have to say toilet paper. Man, 1900s era ghosts must have been losing their shit, pun intended, when they saw all of the toilet paper news coverage coming out of March 2020. So how do you soften the blow of embarrassment from buying toilet paper? Well, you literally soften it. The first brand to attempt this approach was the Hoburg Paper Company, which launched the brand Charmin. They followed its ad agency suggestion to really lean into the softness with feminine branding. When the company introduced a four pack in 1932, the copy on the box read, this bathroom tissue is a perfect cold cream remover. Further pushing the idea that it's totally possible that women just don't poop and they just need this stuff for their faces. And thus, the taboo was broken. TP finally made its way into our homes for everyday use. While we eventually got over our poopless pretense and embraced our dirty daily dumps, the marketing of bathroom tissue remained stuck on the softness angle like a piece of toilet paper on the bottom of your shoe. By 1978, the third most well-known man in America, according to a TV guide poll, was Mr. Whipple, a character from a long-running Charmin campaign. It's just a weird dude who went around squeezing toilet paper in stores. Well, all the same, thanks for normalizing TP, Mr. W. Phew, we've covered a lot of ground here, huh? Okay, let's take a little coffee break. While we're at it, let's look at where the term coffee break came from. In 1952, the Pan American Coffee Bureau just had $2 million kicking around, I guess. Which, with inflation, is about $19.7 million in today money. Anyway, they did a big blitz of a media buy with a campaign that formalized a practice that had been going on since the war, where defense plant workers were given short breaks to refuel with a little cup of the old jitter liquid. The campaign was the first to introduce the idea of a coffee break, and with its aggressive media buy across newspapers, radio, and magazines, the idea cracked the cultural zeitgeist. Not only that, but more and more workplaces started formalizing the coffee break for their employees, turning a line of coffee into a cultural institution. So, what do you think? Notice any of your daily rituals popping up on this list? Surprised to learn their origin stories? Know of any other rituals or routines that originated as ads? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more sponsored thoughts.